Excellent. So hello and welcome. It's a pleasure to have you join us for part two of the ASEAN Full Army Women Action Plan Resistance and Resilience Workshop Series on Climate Change and Transboundary Plant Pests and Diseases. Today we're going to be focusing on genomics uh, and resistance research in a changing climate. My name is Alison Watson and I'll be moderating the session and I'll be joined by three fantastic speakers, Dr. Tech Tay, Dr. Andy Triciono, uh, Dr. Ma and Dr. Zhang. And before we start, I just want to make a special thank you to our key support organisations, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Australia, the ASEAN Secretariat, the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development Vietnam, and CSIRO, which is the host organisation of the ASEAN Full Army Wim Action Plan. Now, just a reminder of how to interact today. Um, please use the Q&A box for asking questions. Um, and please do so as we have these experts here ready to answer anything you throw at them. Uh, I'm, I'm really um, setting them up there for, for, for lots of questions. So please um, feel free to uh, challenge them. Uh, we also know that many of you are working on the subject. So please also introduce yourself in the chat box and also share the work that you're doing. So if you've got a link to some great work or some a new paper or some work in the field that you're doing, please feel free to share that with us in the chat. We really love to generate a good discussion and network, so don't be shy about chatting with everyone and also asking your questions. Just a quick note that this is part two of a two-part series as part of our resistance management program. Today we're exploring the intersection of climate change and transboundary pests in Southeast Asia through a discussion on the influence of changing climate on resistance, including latest research on resistance in Southeast Asia, and also the role of population genomics in understanding further the potential success of future strategies and tools. You can watch uh, part one and part two when it's completed today uh, at our videos page and I've provided the link there for you and you'll also be able to download the copies of all the presentations there as well. Now, just a reminder that Southeast Asia is among the world's most at-risk regions when it comes to the impact of global warming, and this is going to have a serious impact on our farmers, and it will also have an impact on those plant pests and diseases in which climate change may contribute to their wider spread and impact. So it's really critical now to help understand the, this growing threat uh, and determine the range of responses that will help farmers adapt to the new challenges they will face. Following on from our last session, we're going to shine a further light on the topic and aim to stimulate some debate on how to manage resistance in a changing climate. And we've got three, uh, three or four wonderful speakers today. We're going to start off with uh, actually Dr. Ma's presentation, which um, uh, he and Dr. Zhang will be uh, speaking to. We'll then follow on uh, with Dr. Andy Triciano, who's going to talk about the results of regional studies to determine resistance in four Lamiwen populations in Southeast Asia. And we will end with Dr. Tek Tay, who's going to be talking about what the genomics research tells us about key areas for further the research and what knowledge gaps we might wish to address. So it's going to be a very interesting fast-paced uh, session, uh, lots of information, lots of um, maybe new ideas as well and so we're really looking forward to hearing your thoughts and, um, and discussion on that. So without further ado, I would really like to um, welcome uh, Dr. Ma and Dr. Zhang for uh, their presentation. They're going to be talking about climate warming, how it promotes pesticide resistance through expanding the overwintering range uh, of the pest species with a focus on the diamondback um, moth. So I'd like to welcome you to, to the uh, webinar and uh, I leave it with you for the presentation. If you could um, load your presentation and I will stop yeah. sharing. So you'll just need to, yep. Excellent. Hi, Saiful. Yeah. Okay, we go. Yep, perfect. It's just come up. Excellent. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, thanks, Alison, for organizing everything, making us to share our work here. I'm Wei Zhang from Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences. 
I present our group to give this presentation. Uh, our work mainly on the uh, climate change biology of insects in agricultural ecosystem. Today, I would like to talk part of our work on climate warming, overwintering, and uh, pesticide resistance. Uh, as we know, human influence has increased the global surface temperature about 1.3 C centigrade during the past 100 years, according to the new report uh, from IPCC. Uh, many scientists project that uh, global mean temperature will continue to increase in the next 100 years. A globe analyze suggests that winter warming is more significant than summer and autumn warming. Many agricultural pests have no diapers in the winter and undergo annual cycles of seasonal migration, which led to permanent and threatened occurrence. In South Asia, insect pests are permanent. They are able to persist locally all year round. But in North Asia, insect pests are threatened. They immigrate from warm regions in late spring and early summer, but die or emigrate in autumn and winter. Many insects uh, are destructive pests of important crops. Uh, plant hopper in rice, especially the brown plant hopper or red packed plant hopper. Oriental army worm. Four army worm. Rice leaf folder. Importantly for diamond bag moths, the most destructive pests in basic crops in the world, uh, which use uh, usually causing economic loss as high as four to five billion US dollars per year. The mouse has strong resistance to nearly 100 pesticides, the in uh, pesticide, uh, pest insecticides. We show the field is investigation result on overwintering of the diamondback mouse. Uh, it could overwinter in South and Southeast China, in Southeast areas of Australia, in South Korea, when the, warm, the winter is warm, in Japan, where snow cover lasts longer than six days, and also the South areas of the China. But it could not overwinter in Russia, in Mongolia, in North Korea, and also the North part of our China. Despite all this, we have no ideas about the over overwintering range of the diamond back months. It seems to be that diamond back months in South can overwinter successfully, high, highly resistant, resistant to pesticides, but in North, they die in winter less resistant to pesticides. So we have two questions. First, where is the overwintering marginal area of the diamond bag mouse? Oh, sorry. How climate warming expand overwintering range? Overwintering range and the pesticide resistance are traditionally to import different issues. Do they have links each other? To answer the first question, we conducted a lab simulation experiment for winter survival of the mouse, including 10 sites winter temperatures, 11 exposure days, totally 13,000 individuals. The symbols in the map shows the 10 sites we studied. The north part, uh, northmost of the China, uh, Harbin, Siping, and Shenyang. In south part, uh, southmost of China, Guangzhou. We simulate the winter temperature of the 10 sites um, in Panel C and measure the winter survival. 
we use the lab data to build nine winter survival models, including three predictors and three functions. Three predictors include minimum daily temperature, daily mean temperature, low temperature degree days. Here, low temperature degree days, uh, we sh shorten it LTDD, means the number of degree days individuals experienced below the threshold under uh, threshold of 11 C step grid. Three functions, linear, exponential, sigmoid. This figure is about the result of the nine models. Uh, different rows shows uh, uh, different models with the three predictors. The first row is the minimum daily temperature. The third row is the daily mean temperature. And the second row is the low temperature degree days. So the same row sh shows the models with three, function, sh three functions, linear, exponential, sigmoid. So we see the, the red LTDD exponential model can predict 90% of mortality. We also conducted large scale overwintering field experiments for five years, including 12 sites for exposure months to conditions, standing plants, and the post harvest residues, totally 17,000 individuals. We measured the survival under uh, field winter conditions. Use the field data, we validate the nine models. We compared predicted survivals with the observed survivals. We selected the best model is low temperature degree day exponential model. We found this model can predict 62% uh, uh, of the field mortality. LTDD was a powerful variable to predict the winter survival of the species. Besides, it's really easy to calculate from either past climate data or future climate models, which allowed us to examine how the overwintering potential of these species changes at a global scale. Historical climate data analysis shows that increasing winter temperature in the past 50 years have reduced the LTDD. We use the LTDD model to project global overwintering distribution of the months. Uh, look at the top white panel. The red area shows uh, overwintering. The uh, white shows the no overwintering, and the blue shows the boundary. Under the climate change, overwintering range expanded 2.4 million square kilometers over the past 50 years. Look at the panel B. The range will continue to expand at 2.2 million square kilometers for every one C segregate increase. Look at the panel C for the result for two C segregate increase. To answer the second question, we conducted a global meta analysis First, literature search, we use keywords, pesticide resistance, and the diamond backbones or Brutella elastella. We found more than 2,000 studies. Second, we selected study from uh, using selection criteria. Uh, first, the study should monitor the pesticide resistance of field pop populations. Second, use the leaf dip method. Third, provide resistance ratio. This result in 62 studies. Look at the left prisma diagram. It described the details of literature search and selection. Third, we extracted the data from selected publications, including pesticide names, Sampling locations and years, 
number of tested individuals in a biopsy. LC to so, uh, 50 of the field and the susceptible populations and the 95 set confidence intervals. So we gathered uh, nearly 2000 data. First, we calculate the weed resistance ratio to account for differences in sample sizes and the variances across studies. We analyze the links between pesticide and the pesticide resistance and the overwintering type. Here we classified three types of overwintering, permanent winter survival above five percent, marginal between one and five percent, present below one percent. We also considered other factors which affect the pesticide resistance, such as Effective temperature degree days in growing season, we shot it ETDD. And the pesticide type we group as mode of action. Then we used linear mixed model with the weed effect size as a response variable or wintering type and the pesticide type as the fixed vectors, ETDD as a covariant, and the combinations of a simply location and the year as a random factor. We found that our wintering type is the main factor affecting pesticide resistance, considering the temperatures of growing season and the pesticide type. This is the result for the resistance and overwintering type. The different colors of the bar shows the weight of mean resistance, and the pie chart shows their relative frequencies of different levels of resistance. The dark showed low level of resistance, the blue showed the low level. First, uh, we found that mean resistance in overwintering sites, look at the red bar, it was significantly higher than the no overwintering sites, look at the blue bar, about 158 times. Look at the pie chart, especially the dark red parts, it means the high resistance, about, uh, about 100. We found that high resistance resistance occurred four times more frequently in overwintering sites than in no overwintering sites. Practitioners of pest control are especially concerned about high levels of pesticide resistance in regions. So we built quantile regression model driven by LTDD to predict the global distribution of top 15 percent resistance. The risk, uh, this is the result. The red area shows the high level of resistance. The blue and the white area shows the low level. And uh, look at the bright blue lines shows the marginal areas. Together with the overwintering distribution under global warming and the, the uh, top top 15 resistance distribution, we conclude that winter warming promotes pesticide resistance in marginal overwintering regions near the bright blue lines. We can see the US, Mediterranean countries, China, and Japan. A take home, low temperature degree days can be a key predictor for overwintering survival of insects like the diamond bed mouse. LTTD model can be a powerful model to predict overwintering survival of the mouse. Winter warming will improve winter survival of the mouse and thus accumulate resistant individuals across winters. Consequently, expanding high resistance areas and the impede infect effectiveness of pest control efforts. I would like to thank our contributors, 
our group and the NSFC for funding. Thanks for the organizer's work. Thanks for your attention. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wei. That was a great presentation, very well spoken. And I'm just realizing here that I may not have the Q&A box open. Uh, if I don't, everyone and people who do have questions, um, please just write them in the chat uh, because for some reason it is closed in, in the back screen. I'm not sure what happened there, but you can just write them in the chat. So we will still ask all the questions and they're still there and it, it still all works. Uh, I've got some questions here for you um, both. Uh, so if you would like to, you can um, you could stop sharing your screen and we can see you. Oh, yep, I can see you. Right. OK, so you have a question there in the chat that's come up uh, and it was uh, it is about what kind of pesticide groups are resistant to diamondback moth or oh, sorry, what sorry, a diamondback moth's resistant to in the pesticide groups. Did you? Uh, you mean the, the question from uh, King King? Yeah, Mahal. that's right. Yep. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, everyone. There is no Q&A box and that's that's my fault. Okay. Something must have turned off, but well, that uh, works, works well. The, the diamondback mouse can resist uh, uh, mainly uh, with, we found from literature uh, 97 different variety of uh, pesticides um, like uh, this uh, um, BT, the biopesticides, and also uh, the um, new nicotine uh, pesticides. And uh, um, I think uh, the new nicotine pesticide uh, can be uh, very fast um, evolved to the resistance. Uh, this is the mainly, uh, but also because of, uh, during our um, literature analysis, uh, this uh, last for uh, maybe 30 years. So the different uh, um, period of the years, so the, the farmers uh, use different uh, pesticides. So uh, it's include the uh, almost uh, uh, the most used um, pesticides at the uh, different uh, time period of years. Yeah. And doc Dr. Ma, I mean, it, farmers often use a lot of pesticides. Uh, and as you say, it's good to maybe rotate and use them at different times. Um, but are you looking at other ways to manage them as well using biocontrol or other management uh, techniques? Is there work to also inform farmers in these new areas where there's more overwintering to help reduce or change pesticide use? Uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, for this, uh, uh, because of this uh, pesticide resistance of the diamondback mouse is the uh, most, uh, one of the most important uh, problems the farmers uh, have to face. Uh, so uh, when, um, when we found uh, this uh, resistance uh, levels uh, uh, were different uh, from different uh, uh, regions in the yep. north part of China or north part of uh, other uh, areas in the world, they have a low level of resistance. And uh, in the south part of the regions, they have higher level for resistance. Mm -hmm. We are considering how to manage this uh, situation. Uh, one of the most important strategy is uh, uh, we, at least in, in China, we uh, give the recommendations for the farmers in the north part of China. They uh, use different uh, pesticides with the sows, especially the different type of the pesticides with the different uh, 
uh, lasso mode uh, in the uh, me mechanisms like uh, the binding, um, the, binding uh, the target binding or uh, uh, stimulate the enzymes for reduce the uh, toxicity of the uh, pesticides. Uh, yep. So we just give the uh, um, suggestions for different regions with the different uh, uh, types of pesticides. This is the most important. Uh, and a uh, uh, second one is uh, during the whole season, uh, because of the diamond back is especially in, um, I think uh, in South China, we have to um, spray, spray for uh, five, six to 10 times a year. We, uh, we need to uh, tell farmers to give the alternative use different uh, types of the pesticide. This also can reduce the resistance of the Diamond yep. back mouse to the pesticides. Okay, and uh, do you know? Do you know? Um, are there any? Somebody has a question here around biopesticides. Are there biopesticides being used in China for diamond back moth? Biopesticides. We uh, let's say BT. Uh, this bacillus uh, thuringiensis. Uh, um, this uh, pesticide uh, was uh, fermented uh, from the uh, bacteria, uh, this uh, uh, we call this uh, bio uh, pesticides. And uh, the amateur most develop a very strong uh, resistance to the BT. And uh, for others like uh, uh, botanic uh, pesticides, uh, so far, because this application scale is not that large. Okay. Uh, not mm, very uh, perfect data has showed the resistance to these botanic uh, okay. uh, pesticides. Okay. And thank for, for other uh, uh, natural enemies, uh, we didn't find any resistance. Uh, maybe it works. And also, uh, in some of the areas like in southwest China, uh, in that area, uh, because the you know uh, one plot of the uh, grassfers crop, like uh, cabbage or cauliflower, uh, um, was uh, harvest, and the, the diamond back moth kind of can migrate from this plot to next uh, neighbor uh, plot. Okay. Uh, and in this case, uh, we also can use some uh, method to. Uh, such as uh, uh, using the tillage to to um, cover the residues of the post harvest uh, plant tissues, and uh, uh, with this method we can kill many larvae and egg and pupa. Yep. Uh, and Good with the uh, uh, pheromone uh, trap, we can uh, attract or trap the adults. Yep. And uh, uh, the diamond back mouse have a strong uh, preference to the uh, light. And we also can use a light trap to uh, trap the uh, adults. So such kind of uh, different uh, um, types of pesticides. And management. Uh, uh, um, alternatives can be used. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. And I think that's an important point. I, I think you mentioned a good one there around um, uh, destroying or um, getting rid of the residues that people are uh, farmers are throwing away that may have or contain lots of diamondback moth on them, the larvae. Really good point there around the management techniques. I've got one last question for you. And I know that you're you're doing work on climate change and plant pest and diseases, um, and particularly this diamondback moth. Are there other plant pest and diseases that you're looking at where you're looking at the interaction with climate, climate change? Uh, yes, we, uh, um, my group mainly, uh, since uh, our um, time and uh, energy, our resources is limited, we just select the three types yep. of uh, representative uh, uh, insect species. One is uh, 
we could have tiny insects, include aphids, thrips, mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, spider mites, um, uh, and uh, Tosophila flies, uh, spotted wing uh, Tosophila. Yeah. Uh, we 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 call this tiny insects. So this kind of uh, insects, uh, you know, have a very small body size and uh, rapid uh, reproduction. Uh, they are very sensitive to short time climate change, like uh, uh, three days heat wave. Uh, will uh, especially uh, in, impact their uh, uh, population demographics uh, and. Uh, Finally, the population size. We, we uh, study some rapid revolution of these pest pests to the uh, uh, heat waves or extreme high temperatures. And the second part of the uh, insect group, we like the diamondback mouse. These are uh, um, many insects, destructive insects belong to these groups, like the plant hoppers. Uh, and uh, rice plant uh, folders and also oriental armyworms and also very famous uh, for uh, armyworms belong to this. Uh, the just uh, um, a few minutes ago, the presentation uh, gave them um, a study method can be applied uh, to this kind of um, insect pest with a, a long distance uh, migration. Yeah, uh, we can determine the overwintering. Uh, region and uh, know our entire region with our method and uh, then uh, give the recommendations for pesticides uh, uh, resistance control. Excellent. And, uh, uh, we just can follow the similar strategies. And the third uh, uh, groups of pests is uh, they can locally overwinter with uh, winter dipoles uh, and uh, such kind of insects they have a very different uh, uh, different uh, biology or, or ecology with the climate change. Yeah. And uh, especially, uh, you know, uh, this insect uh, uh, was induced to the dipoles in winter. Uh, in the autumn, uh, the photo period is uh, not changed anything, but the temperature now is uh, increased a lot. Yeah. So uh, maybe this is synchronization of this uh, environment. Uh, conditions like the uh, temperature increase, but, but the uh, uh, photo period um, unchanged, and yeah. th this will be a challenge for the uh, such kind of insects. We also look look after uh, some impacts exactly. or adaptations of the uh, insect to the climate change during winter times. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ma. That that was excellent. I'm, I'm quite excited about the work that you've just talked about as well. Uh, sounds like you've got a very interesting program, and uh, we're looking forward to perhaps maybe working with you in the future uh, when we're looking at what we would like to do in 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 these programs. And hopefully, some of the researchers that are listening today. Uh, I think might reach out to you as well. And I know uh, Tech might talk about some of the research that you might have an interest in at the end uh, of this presentation. So thank you to both you and Wei for uh, an excellent presentation, uh, very interesting work, and we appreciate you spending your time with us today. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And you've got lots of, you've got lots of claps. <laughs> If you have any uh, uh, questions or need, need me to do some assistance for anything, just contact me. Oh, thank you so much. And I see that there's some questions. I'm sorry the Q&A box isn't working today, uh, everyone, but it's okay because everyone can also see all the questions there, which is quite nice sometimes. Uh, there's a few questions in there, Dr. Ma and, and uh, Dr. Zhang, that you could maybe, uh, if you look at and feel like you'd like to answer, please, please do so. But I'd like to um, thank you and I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Andy Trisciano, who's going to talk about the latest research uh, uh, looking at resistance and fall armyworm populations across Southeast Asia. And I'm just going to give a big shout out, not just to Andy, uh, who's always a, a, an excellent participant and um, contributor to all the work in Southeast Asia in the ASEAN Action Plan, but also to all your research colleagues that worked across Southeast Asia on this project, Andy. So everyone else who's in the room, um, a thumbs up to you as well. So Andy? Well, okay. Thank you, Alison. 
Uh, hello, everyone. Good day, wherever you are. So I'm going to share my slide. Yeah, can you see my slide? I can indeed. It's perfect. OK, thank you. So um, on behalf of the collaborators from Australia, from Laos, uh, Malaysia, Philippines, and Vietnam, and also from Indonesia, I would like to thank to Alison and the team for inviting us to participate in this webinar, and also for um, a few uh, sponsors who made this uh, study happen. Okay, so I'm going to share uh, with three different subtopics why regional studies is important, and are the population, the current population, are resistant and what should we do next based on uh, the preliminary study that we have done uh, until today. So at least we listed three different items which support why regional studies are important for us. The first one is that resistance has been reported to different insecticide in different countries, uh, especially for uh, the countries that has been invited by this insect for quite a long time. Second, Polamay worm is long migratory insects. It means that insects that are in the regions may influence or may come anytime that they want to into uh, countries in the region. In this case, it's Southeast Asia. So I think dealing with these insects, not only we are dealing with the uh, population that are locally found in each country, but because of the migration among the countries or in the region, I think we should also uh, take care about it and try to mitigate and anticipate what is going to happen with these insects. The third one is that some researchers uh, have mentioned that um, insects have been arrival um, multiple times in a certain countries. And this uh, support the resistance management at the regional level will complement in the country management strategies. Because as I mentioned earlier, that dealing with the local population in one thing, but we also have to anticipate what population will be coming in the future that might be coming from different countries in the region or even in different um, um, outside of the Southeast Asia. So in this study, we employed three different um, bioassay procedures. One is that incorporation. And this approach or this method was used to test the uh, four different insecticides, spinetoram, chloratronilipor, emamectin benzoate, and endoxacrab. And then the second bioassay procedure is using a topical application, and it was used for alpha cepametrin and tomil. So basically, these are the two uh, protocols that use for six different um, chemical insecticide. And then we used the third one, which is the diet overlay for testing four different toxins from Bacillus thuringiensis. And also my colleagues from uh, Philippines also used the diet overlay to test three different um, uh, species of Bacillus. So let's see um, what countries and uh, what insecticide uh, they tested. So as mentioned that uh, five um, countries in the Southeast Asia involved in this project tested six different chemical synthetic insecticide, four different PT toxin, and three different species of Bacillus thuringiensis. And for some reason, not all the countries tested all the insecticide. Okay, the first bioassay procedure was diet incorporation, and this was used for different insecticide and. Uh, the good thing for this technique is that the insecticide is evenly distributed the whole diet. So wherever the larva feed on, they will be have some contact or ingested the toxin or the diet or, or the insecticide that we are testing. I think that's the advantage of uh, having used uh, this, this technique. And this is the result. Let's say uh, we are talking about chloratronilipol. Three countries involved for testing this insecticide, Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia. And we look at uh, on the value of the LC50 or LC50 um, from the uh, lowest to the highest. In this case, is the lowest is from Malaysia and the highest is from Indonesia. So the difference is 17 times. Using the same procedures, different population from different country, and the difference 
in terms of the susceptibility is 17 times. Interestingly, for imamectin benzoate, with two populations from Indonesia and Malaysia, the difference was less than uh, for collateral liver, which we only mentioned five, diff uh, five time differences. And again, for indoxacarb, we also um, noted uh, 14 time differences between the population from Malaysia and Indonesia, where the population from Malaysia was more susceptible than those in Indonesia. Spinitoram, we cannot compare because only Indonesia who did testing for this insecticide. So from the first of the bioassay procedure, we tested four different um, insecticides and we could see uh, the differences between uh, two or three countries ranging from five to 17 times. Okay, what about in Indonesia, we tested four different insecticides and uh, we're using the same procedure, the same population. And it's very, very interesting that emamectin benzoate was much more toxic than the other three insecticides. And if we calculated the uh, differences between the lowest or the most toxic to the least toxic, which is endoxacrab, the differences is 368 times. Okay. Second bioassay was topical application, and this is done for two different um, um, insecticides. The first one is alpha cipermetrin, and we tested uh, from two population from Indonesia, Laos, and Malaysia. And as you can see here, the population from Laos was the least susceptible, and population from Indonesia was the most susceptible. And the differences between the lowest and the highest um, values of LC50 was about 10 times. For metomils, again, we would not be able to compare because there is only one population being tested for this insecticide. Okay, what about the population from Indonesia? Because we, we have two different insecticides being tested and uh, the risk was very much similar in terms of the uh, the toxicity of alpha cimetrin and metomil to the population of polamivum from Indonesia because the difference was less than two times. Okay, so this is the last bioassay uh, procedure that we employed for testing, particularly for PT toxin and Bacillus thuringiensis species. And let's take a look for cry one AC and cry one F. So Indonesia and Vietnam did the uh, research on this one. And it's a bit surprising that the population from Indonesia was 50 times less susceptible than that from Vietnam to cry one ac And the number is a bit similar when we look at or when we try or when we test it with the cry one f where the difference was about 60 times. Again, the population from Indonesia was less susceptible than that from Vietnam. And the number, even though the numbers, I mean, the exact number is different, but at least the comparison when we, we tested with the CRY1, a CRY2AB and a VIP against that the population from Indonesia was less susceptible to CRY2AB and also from uh, for VIP toxin with differences about 82 and 40 times respectively. Um, the colleagues from Philippines uh, tested uh, three different um, Bacillus species, Bacillus amylivorcoaceans, Bacillus thuringiensis, and Bacillus uh, substilis uh, from the same population. And what we found is that the toxicity of this this species of Bacillus thuringiensis against the population from Philippines was very much similar, where the differences is, uh, was less than three times. And again, for the PD toxin, um, we are lucky that we, we had a four different PD toxin and we can compare it. And uh, because the uh, CRY1F and VIP3A was prepared in different ways, so we cannot compare the result from CRY1AC compared to CRY1F. 
So we have to compare CRY1 AC and CRY2AB, and we can also compare CRY1F and VIP3A because of the unknown purity. And the result was very much similar, where the toxicity of CRY1 AC and CRY2AB was very much similar to the population of Polame 1 from Indonesia. And also CRY1F also was very much similar in terms of its toxicity compared to VIP3A. Okay, in summary, uh, the differences in susceptibility of all armyworm in North Asia were noted to all tested insecticide and PD toxin, and the different toxicity among the tested insecticide to the same population. And we think that the resistance was brought by the parent population that come to its country, considering that this study was done in 2000 and 2001. And in most cases, it, uh, it has been reported that fall armyworm came to Southeast Asia in 2019. So it is unlikely that the local selection due to the spraying have contributed to the development of resistance. Okay, that's the, I think that's the summary and also the thinking why the, the data is different from country to country. Comparing biosy results only possible if insecticide are tested using the same biosy method. I think this is the reason why we use the same protocol. Insecticide, the interest of Southeast Asia countries should be determined. Because as I mentioned earlier, in country resistant management is important, but considering and anticipating the movement of the insects in the regions, I think we should come up with some kind of list. What are the interests in terms of insecticide that should be continued to do the research so that we can share the data and we can compare the data from uh, countries in the region. So we need to establish a reference population for future studies because all the tested in five different countries use a population that collected from the field. So having susceptible population or the reference population is very, very important. And I think I just want to mention that we have uh, one population that we collected in 2019 and still in the lab. So that uh, we are uh, trying to use that as a reference population for studying resistance in the future. So I think lastly, what we should be doing is we need to select establish and mastering the similar biosy protocols and to share the results. This will help in designing resistant management strategies in the regional, Southeast Asia, and also at the national level. I think that's what we can share based on our studies um, that has been done in five um, countries in Southeast Asia and also actually from Australia, but probably in the next speaker, Dr. Tech will uh, share some of the data from Australia. Thank you, Alison, and I'll return it to you. And Thank you. I'll close my um, PowerPoint. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Andy. Um, great presentation and great to see all that collaborative work uh, going on and research. So I've got a, a, there's questions that I'm going to ask you in the chat uh, and lots of good feedback, excellent presentation, great work and insights, the, the last person has just said. Um, a question to you, how easy it was it to have uh, those, that sort of similar approach to to the research? Was that, was that a challenge, getting everyone to do the same uh, approach? Yes, it was a challenge, you know, but I think uh, our colleague tech did a really good job collecting us together. You know, we had a, um, a what do you call webinar several times, Zoom several times to make sure that everyone is going to be okay in doing the research and carrying out the research. Yeah. And sharing um, with the email, uh, very good also between us to share our experiences one to each other. Yeah, excellent. And um, a big shout out to everyone again, just to say, because it was in the middle of COVID, uh, well, right through COVID that this whole research was done. And I know that was a challenge uh, for many of you uh, involved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, here, here's, some yes. question. <laughs> here's some questions for you uh, from people in the room. I'm just going to go back. Um, and I think you sort of answered this at the end, and I know Tech will probably deal with this, but what is the reason for Indonesian fall armyworms showing more tolerance 
uh, to be tea toxins in other countries? Yeah, so I think, as I mentioned uh, uh, a little bit during my presentation, I was a bit surprised comparing with the Vietnam population, you know, because historically, I think um, the fall army worm was in the, in the country about less than two years. That's the one fact. Second fact is that Bacillus thuringiensis is unlikely used by the farmer to control the Bacillus thuringiensis. So I think that's the reason uh, at, the, at the end of my presentation. So it seems to me that local selection, I mean, because of the spraying, unlikely to contribute to the development of resistance. So hopefully the data from uh, Dr. Tech will, uh, you know, will uh, open up the, the gate, whether is it because of the parent population are different, you know, the yeah. population that came to Indonesia and Vietnam were different so that they have different level of resistance to bacillus thuringiensis. Okay, great, That's great it. answer, yeah. Andy. And, mm -hmm. and I'm sure um, Tech's going to cover that as well. Uh, here's a question from Charlie. Um, hi, Dr. Andy, for the diet incorporation test, what larva, larvae stage did you use for this test? Um, it was on the third instar larvae. And it is challenging also, you know, if you, if you test it with the third or fourth instar and you require at least 400 larvae for each insecticide with the same age of the larvae at this, on the same day doing the testing, it's challenging, you know, it's easier to use the first instar larvae rather than the late larvae, you know. But as you know that we have different reasons why we use the third, why we use the one, we use different technology technique of bioassay. I think there are some reasons uh, in selecting that one, but we are lucky that we can come up with the data and we can share it uh, to all of all of you today. So great. And and just a question: Was it quite hard um, with your sort of populations or your your diets? Was it quite hard sort of working out what diet for the for your insta for your your fall army worm? Was that a challenge or? Well, uh, the diet has been very much established in um, in our lab you know actually the diet yep. was originally uh, we developed the diet for uh, asian corn border okay uh, originally yep. you know when we when we collect the 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 fall army worm from the field and then we try to use the same diet for fall army worm it was lucky that they feed it on it and they it seemed that they live you know happily and ever so that it has been three years using the same diet and we see the population are doing okay so <laughs> uh, uh, i do not know we are we having a luck for for with the diet i guess yeah excellent andy <laughs> um so here's a question here if we use the tests of the pesticides and the bt toxins to control fall armyworm that, that you showed which is the most effective to control fall armyworm in the field well i think the most sensitive um during the well, I mean, one stage is the first instar. Uh, we did other research, but not with the PT. Tried to compare uh, the different level of susceptibility among the instar of the larvae, and um, and we have done this kind of research for different species as well. And we always found that the first instar larvae is the most susceptible stage during okay. the larval stage. So if you want to hit with any insecticide. I think that's the best way. And also the first instar is usually is still staying on the leaf, not in the wall. When, because when the larva become the third or later, they tend to stay in the warm and it's covered by the fresh, which is difficult for Bacillus thuringiensis to work. Yep, excellent. Okay, great. Um, and here's a, you mentioned how it's, it's important potentially um, to maintain a susceptible reference population. Are you meaning in each, for, for Southeast Asia, are you meaning in each country or would you mean for the region or can you tell us a little bit more about how that you might see that? Well, if one in the lab in the Southeast Asia has already reference, has a reference population has been in the lab for quite a long time without any slacks. I think that's the one the best. You know, we can share it using the, uh, of course, we have to go through the quarantine procedure, but the longest, I think the better, you know. And I mentioned that what we have here is the population that we have been uh, culturing in the lab since the arrival of Paul well, Imer Worm in Indonesia in 2019. So hopefully, you know, this lab, I mean, this population will stay in the lab. So 
in the next four or five years, I'm sure there will be a more homogeneous population and they, this can be used as a reference population for doing any kind of resistance studies. Okay, Andy, I've got a bit of a question here. I mean, I know you're out in the field quite a lot working with farmers mm. uh, and um, and what's the chances of, I mean, fall armyworm, I think, was first reported in 2019 or 2018 in Indonesia? 2019. 2019, as you said. Mm -hmm. what, how, how, what is the potential it could have arrived earlier and it was missed? Or what, what do you think is sometimes the lag time between it being in the field potentially and farmers not realising it's there and, and officials? And how, how long, in your view, could that or... Yeah, that's a good question. I I, I try to look at <laughs> try to look at any information that you know I can find in Indonesia, but I do not have a very clear answers. But the first damage we noticed actually in 29, 2019. 2019. Yeah, the the yep. first you know uh, prominent damage in the field was noticed in 2019. But as entomologists, we know that the population will not build up in a month. You know? yeah. So when the damage and especially huge damage occur, it means that the population has been there for a while. Yeah. But there is no record uh, that I can find it before 2019. Okay, great answer. Yeah. Hey, Andy, thank you so much. I'm going to um, hand it over to Tech now, who's going to sort of pick up on where you mm. left off. And uh, if you can stay around, because I know there'll be some questions at the end, and you, you might be able to help Tech out, uh, answer some of those questions as well. Um, there's probably quite a few comments there in the chat. Um, lots of people have, uh, have been um, very impressed by your presentation and the research. And just uh, remember to everyone that that is actually a big team behind this. Uh, so, and Andy, is sort of presenting on behalf of the team and, and very ably. Um, but uh, for all those who are also in the room from that team, which I'm sure Tech will mention as well, um, uh, a big thanks to you as well. So really important research. We're looking forward to seeing the next steps and where it goes now, Andy. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, and welcome to Tech. Uh, Good evening from Canberra, everyone, uh, or good day and good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Uh, can you see my screen? Please? Yeah, I'm just waiting for it to be. Uh... Yep, perfect. Looks good, Tech. Fabulous. Uh, just give me a moment. I'll just get myself set up. So. Uh, Thank you, Alison, for, for the invitation to present uh, at this uh, second climate change resistant resilience and transboundary plant pests and disease series. So uh, as Andy said, uh, this is a big project. So I'm following onto uh, uh, the genomics part of the work that, that is part of the work that Andy had presented. So this was a work uh, funded by the Australian government, uh, Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research by the Grains Research and Development Corporation, by the Cotton Research Development Corporation, and also by uh, FMC Corteva, Dow and Sugar Research Australia. So we have a huge group of researchers that are uh, involved in this work. Uh, we have Australian partners, we have uh, Vietnam partners, Myanmar, uh, Dr. King, Laos, Philippines, Cabby from Malaysia, Andy and his team, uh, Valen. And then we have Cambodia and we also have Uganda. So here's what Andy was talking about. So this is one of the screenshots taken during the pandemic. We had our usual meeting. Here we have uh, Andrew Kalebi from Uganda and we have various people from uh, Southeast Asia and from Australia. So the, the research involved uh, CSRO, and we have uh, researchers from all across most of the Southeast Asian countries. Uh, we also have unofficial partners from Papua New Guinea and also from East Asia, from South Korea. <clears throat> so I just want to quickly explain why we are looking at this. So this is, uh, we're trying to use genomics to provide better support of how the pest is spreading so fast across the world. So we all know that uh, the majority of the studies that we are reading 
uh, the literature out there is based on single gene markers. So we're talking about the partial CO1 or partial cytochrome B, which is a maternally inherited markers. As well as we're looking at a TPI, which is an X chromosome, uh, the, the sex chromosome, uh, sex link chromosome partial gene, again, four, 500 base pair maximum. And the, these single genes, predominantly the CO1 or the TPI is suggesting that it is a single introduction pathway. That's because the populations from Western Africa and the rest of the world are very much identical overall. So this suggests that the populations are very low in genetic diversity. And because from Western Africa, when it's reported, the other countries looking subsequently next to the country that is reported, it seems to suggest that the pest is really spreading very fast from Western Africa across to the East. And subsequently within two, three years, we are having this pest spreading all across the world. So what are the implications if we get this wrong? We could be underestimating that there are other factors underpinning the, the, the rapid spread of this pest. And we could be missing the lessons. So for example, if there were multiple introductions and we are only assuming that it is a population that was founded in Western Africa, we could be missing the chance to fix up our own biosecurity weakness. And with this misinterpretation and potentially misidentified factors, we could be facing a, a huge challenge when we're trying to understand how this pest is adapting to climate change. So let me first take you back a step and show you what the genetic signature should look like if a pest was truly single founder event. So this is a study uh, that was uh, published in 2019, looking at the, the tomato leafworm, Tuta absoluta. So here, here we are, and it's, it's a pest that's seriously damaging tomato crops. It is assumed to have spread from the uh, South America uh, since the 1960s, and it was introduced into first into uh, Europe. Subsequently, it went into Africa as well as it, it went across towards uh, Southeast Asia and now reported in, for example, China as well. And this is based on nuclear markers. So these are microsatellite markers. And this is what we would see. If it was a single founder event, you would see that there are clusters of populations with fairly homogeneous pop, uh, structure, uh, blocks of, of uh, colors. And you have the populations that are different, so they're in different colors. And then you have the invasive population, which are pretty much identical in signature. So this is what single founders would look like because they came from very limited genetic diversity and the subsequent invaded populations all look pretty much identical to the original founders. And with single founders uh, populations, it is more easily to be able to identify the founding, uh, the, the origin of the invasive populations. So with single founders, this is exactly what we should be seeing in four army worms. Now, instead, if we look at the, pop, uh, the nuclear genome signature. In this case, this is a study that we first look at uh, that was published in Communications Biology, just came out this year. And looking at the native populations versus Benin, for example, Western Africa, Uganda, India, and China. And you can see that in all this population structure analysis, there is not one example that demonstrate that it is a single founding population. So if we were to say that it is originating from Western Africa, from Benin, here is Benin. This is a signature that we should be seeing in, West, in Eastern Africa, for example, in Tanzania, in Uganda, and in, in Malawi. And yet the population is actually really very different from Benin. So, 
this is suggesting that there are multiple introductions. And in fact, in Africa alone, there were at least separate introductions. And based on gene flow, we were able to identify that the, the movement of the population is likely to be from Asia. In this case, we only have Chinese population. So in this case, this is not saying that the population came from China, it just represents the region, Asia. It's moving into Malawi, for example, into Uganda. So this seems to be quite contradictory to what the other studies are showing, but this is based on nearly a thousand markers across the genome. And what about in Southeast Asia, in, Austra uh, in, in the region where Australia is interested in, because we know that this pest can migrate and we really need to know what the population look like in Southeast Asia so that we can prepare the Australian farmers and growers to this pest. So looking at the, using the same markers, looking at across uh, multiple Australian populations. And we can see that, the, again, the population structure is really, really mixed. It's suggesting that the populations are very, very diverse. <clears throat> so using one of the example in, that was published also this year, looking at microsatellite markers, similar as the number of markers in Tuta Absoluta, the, 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 the first slide that I show you, Jiang et al. from Nanjing Agricultural University found that in China itself, there were very many different clusters of population, suggesting that, in fact, this pest had arrived in China multiple times independently. They are quite different between each other. Likewise, in Malaysia, what we found was that in Malaysia, there were at least three different clusters based on the different uh, <clears throat> population that were sent to us. Similarly, in Myanmar, what we were expected was that Myanmar population should be very similar to the Chinese population. And yet the Myanmar population's signature, for example, if you look at here, the colors versus uh, the Chinese populations, is suggesting that Myanmar populations were very different from China. So the hypothesis that Myanmar population arrived first and then went into China is in fact not supported in this case. So this is uh, a study that uh, uh, is currently being reviewed, but I'll just very quickly summarize what it, it shows. We're looking at gene flow uh, directionality and what we can see is that the purple color arrow suggests unidirectional, whereas the red color suggests bidirectional. And the red color is saying that <clears throat> these are the source population and they're moving between very closely related uh, neighboring countries, for example, Malaysia to Myanmar, Malaysia to Vietnam and so forth. But Malaysia, for example, have been shown to be directly going across to East Africa. Likewise, China, as, again, don't take this as a country, it's more like the region. And it's suggesting that <clears throat> there is really very high diversity in our region, in the Southeast Asian region. And I'd like to just quickly show you this. The first time I came across this thesis that was shared by our Vietnamese collaborators, I was fabergasted. It was thesis was published in 2008. And this is a picture of a four army worm that was causing a lot of damage in the parks around Hanoi. And this is 2008. This is at least 10 years before the, uh, the, the reported outbreak in Africa. So this is quite interesting, suggesting that this pest potentially had been in our region for a very, very long time. Again, Looking at Australia, in Australia, the samples that we use represent the first year. And the red color means that these populations are not moving uh, between each other. Whereas the green color suggests that the, the, their gene flow and they are moving between populations. So if you look at Australian populations, by and large, they are very unique. They are not really moving between each other. 
And this is between, especially between the Western Australian population and the Queensland population. Whereas in Southeast Asia, Africa, and, and Asia, there are more green colors between populations, suggesting that the populations are starting to mix up a bit more. So in this case, what we can interpret is that arrival of the four army women into Australia likely to have involved multiple pathways. And this is the case for all the other countries as well. There are multiple arrival, multiple ways of getting into the country, suggesting that across the world, in fact, we are very bad at biosecurity. We are very bad at stopping pests coming. And this is a phylogeny based on the nearly a thousand markers. And we can see that there are multiple introduction signatures as I indicated by the red arrows. For example, Africa, Benin, there are a few individuals that are sitting at the very basal. And then you have China, which is sitting by themselves. But then you have Benin, Uganda, and Malawi sitting at the edge of, of all these Southeast Asian populations. So Southeast Asian populations are basal. They are at the bottom. They, do, they, they are the originator of the African populations. Likewise, well, Australia, which are represented by green, you have multiple greens coming in at different places from different places of uh, Southeast Asia. And South Korea is quite different by itself again. So again, this is just to highlight that there are multiple pathways into Australia, but in fact, multiple pathways into everywhere. And this is a work that we summarized from based on the whole genome study um, that involved uh, the Asian, uh, Southeast Asian partners. And again, you would expect that if populations were coming in from Africa, this is the type of signature that we should be looking at. And yet in Australia, for example, you don't have that. You have something completely different or for the ACE1 allele G227A in Indonesia, all of a sudden we have something that is so unexpected coming up, suggesting that potentially this is an independent introduction. Likewise, across Africa, across Australia and most of Southeast Asia, other than Indonesia, that we have this. And then in China, we have all of a sudden some population popping up with the same alleles. Again, suggesting that this population in, in Hubei is actually quite unique. And again, supporting the fact that it could be independent introductions across all our regions. So in summary, it looks like there are multiple introductions that have resulted in what we then concluded as a very rapid spread of this pest. So this suggests that there are biosecurity weaknesses all across all the countries that have been impacted by this four army worm. And in fact, this pest, now that it has arrived in our region, carries huge genetic diversity, different resistant profiles, different, and, and that's just only one genetic trait. So what about their, their ability to withstand different climates? And are there ongoing introductions? Probably, but we need to do more study. So there are multiple pathways into our region and there are evidence of uh, Asia to Africa spread rather than Africa to Asia. So here, for example, we look at a USDA uh, publicly available data. And this is from Lab Intercept. And you can go to the website, type in Lab Intercept and look up for Dr. Fuji Perda, and you will see that the pest has been intercepted from, for example, China, Indonesia, Thailand, Netherlands, which is a hub for cut flowers from, for example, Africa and so forth. And this was last updated in February 2014. Again, this is before 2016 when it was reported in Benin. So this is very interesting. Now they didn't do a molecular identification as well, but I think that for the lab intercept personnel to be able to, to say that it's for Dr. Fuji Perla, it's probably carry some weight because this is after all a pest from the country and from the region. And we really need global four army worm genomic resources because this can help us to identify new management options, such as for example, identify the genes 
that we can develop RNAi against. But also, it is better, it can help us to better understand how this pest can adapt to the new environment. And why is this important? Well, the world is getting hotter and it is getting drier. So this is just the news that have been making around the world in the last few months in Europe, for example, the lakes are getting drier. In China, severe drought and heat wave. UK, bushfire declare and so forth. And it just goes on and on. But in other countries, in other places, it is getting more wet. So in Cambodia, in Vietnam, for example, uh, the places have just been flooded. There's been amazing uh, cyclone, typhoon. In Australia, we have had two years of nonstop rain and everywhere is flooded. Pakistan is flooding as well. So the world is getting hotter and drier in some places and it's getting better in other places. So what about climate change and how is it going to impact on this pest? Well, we know that in noctuid insects, that's including four army worms, they are impacted by high or low humidity. And these factors impact on their egg hatching rate, larva survival rate, oviposition and larva emergence rate. So taking China as an example, so is China getting hotter and drier based on the current trend? Well, we hope not, but it's looking like the world is not gonna escape this climate change. And based on this study by Jiang et al, they have simulated the scenario where uh, it is predicted as a suitable uh, <clears throat> area for, for the four army wounds. So this is compared to the current scenario, which is some areas are mildly uh, suitable for the four army ones, but it's saying that as the temperature gets, as, as a climate change, more area will become more suitable for the four army ones. But this does not really make sense because the lava and the, the, the species is impacted by very high or very low humidity. So, <clears throat> what we did using a uh, climate uh, modeling, uh, looking at the, between current and 2018, what we can see that is that, for example, looking at China, indeed, there were a bit more areas that used to be very unsuitable for, for the four army ones that are currently, so it's too cold, it becomes more suitable. But for India, for example, the, the pest then flies uh, becomes a fly in fly out visitor where they are using the, the coastal region that are warmer and, and, and with probably better uh, buffer by the extreme temperature, they become the, the, the area where the pest has permanent populations. And it seems that the pest potentially is under threat, if you like, in the native country, it's becoming less suitable. But these are just simulated studies and we don't really have a lot of data to go about. And these are models that can be further improved. So this brings me to the end of my slide and the, the knowledge gap. And I just want to remind everyone that the pest is not genetically homogeneous across all the invasive range. Based on whole genome analysis, or so based on looking at the genome across the genome, rather than just single markers, is that the pests is actually quite diverse and they carry with them a lot of genetic trait that we still don't understand. So for example, global uh, and international effort are uh, developing elite maize varieties that can tolerate for army worms. But we don't actually know what is the population, the genomic background of the population that is being used to test these maize varieties. Are they the same population that is going to be in, for example, China, or is it going to be in, in Myanmar, where the, the maize elite strain variety might be introduced there? Will that actually be a futile exercise if they, they have very different four army men that can actually attack this elite uh, maize line anyway? So we don't really know. There's a lot of uh, unknown uh, when it comes to this pest. And our new 
populations carrying new genotypes still arriving? Are, where are they coming from and where are they going to? Again, we don't really know much about it. And the speed and distance of spread, we really need to get down to the bottom of it to really understand, is it natural? How far is the natural movement versus the human assisted movement? So how diverse is the four army, four army women across the invasive range? In fact, all I can say is in a lot of these countries, we just don't know. Uh, a lot of single gene markers have been, have, been, have been done and saying that they're all homogeneous, but we can't just base on a single gene to say that they are the same. We really have to look across the whole genome. And some of the countries like, for example, Andy, where we are partnering Andy, we have not been able to get the samples from Indonesia to look at the population. This is because of COVID, that's a really unfortunate time but also because of different government policies, such as import exporting uh, uh, regulations that, that's preventing scientists to share material to really understand and be able to help the, the farmers better. We also do not know how far I mean, when we adapt to the hotter, drier or wetter climate. Do they have shorter life cycles? Uh, are they better at, at reproducing or is their reproduction impacted? Do their larvae grow bigger, stronger or weaker? We, we just don't know a lot of these things. And we really need to have a better predictive models. And also just looking at the whole genome to better understand how plastic, what's the plasticity of the genome? How quickly can they adapt to the new uh, changing world? And finally, I just throw this in because there's just so many unknown and one of the biggest unknown that we would like to be able to better use IPM, for example, is uh, the beneficial insects. How, how will the beneficial insects adapt to a new climate, to the new host? So with that, I'd just like to thank you for your attention and uh, any questions, I, I haven't looked at it, but thanks, I'm sure they thanks, might be Jack. Done. There are, there thank are some questions, and um, we haven't got much time, so I'm going to go super fast. You're going to you're yeah. going to have to do rapid fire uh, answers here. Um, so we might just finish five minutes late, uh, everyone. Um, My apologies. Just to, to, no, 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 don't apologize because that was an excellent presentation. You had a lot of uh, very valuable, <laughs> rich information there that is even a bit challenging, maybe um, for some, because it really does uh, paint a different picture of what many people talk about with the uh, spread of fall army women from Africa to Asia, what you're saying is actually quite different. Um, so it's a really important conversation and great presentation tech. Um, really appreciate it. Um, I think you sort of sort of talked about this just at the end around um, the different sort of populations. There's a question here. Um, with fall army worm not being genetically homogenous and being able to multiply very fast, could this also mean that there could be selectivity in regards to survival of fall army worm in hotter conditions, for example, or maybe conditions that it's not necessarily uh, historically good at, meaning that climate might get hotter, but fall army worm future populations would be able to adapt? Could that happen? Uh, yeah, look, good, good question. Um, I think this pest is, is taking everyone by quite uh, a lot of surprise, actually. Uh, I, I truly cannot un answer uh, how this pest will, will respond to the, to the hotter, warmer climate. It all depends on which country they arrive in. So we, we can take, for example, one of the most recent uh, example of the four army worm in New Zealand. So uh, the pest was uh, detected in April this year, as uh, everyone living in the southern part of the world would know, this is approaching winter. So we would anticipate that the pest is going to be doing poorly because winter in New Zealand could be cold and wet. And yet uh, this winter is nearly finished now and the pest has increased in population and has not wiped out the pest. So winter has not really impacted this pest, but New Zealand has had one of the warmest <laughs> and wettest uh, winter. So it, it, we really, it, it's, it's going to be very difficult to predict what the pest will do. And it all depends on how quickly we can respond to the pest. And to do that, we really need to really get a, a, a good understanding of what the genome, what, what its genome is like.
Uh, yep. And that's all I can say. Yeah. Excellent. And, and just on that, I mean, you're talking not talking about warm and wet. What about cold? Cold uh, weather. I mean, how cold can fall armyworm survive in? And, and what what's the what, what do we know there? Much? That, that's. I mean, again, you know, like most people. Million uh, if dollar question. The, <laughs> if, if you look at the literature, it is you know around. I guess depend on what which literature we it can be between eight to thirteen degrees is what people tend to say that or, or the past studies that says that they, they do poorly or they don't they don't do well at all. Uh, but again, you know, it'd be very interesting to look at New Zealand's lowest temperature and say what happened there. Yep. Yeah, no, good point. You mentioned like um I guess interceptions I think came up and you you actually um showed some interceptions I think 2014. So prior to the 2018, 20 sort of 19 sort of intro you know, fantastic introduction all of a sudden in, in many places. So for these interceptions, what and you talked about possibly trade being a big factor, potentially not just natural um, spread. What kind of things are these being intercepted on? What, what kind of products are you seeing fall armyworm in the past? You said so cut, if you, cut flowers, I think was one. Yeah, cut flowers is definitely one. Um, so, um, but one of the best uh, resources that anyone can go to look at is the uh, the European Union uh, phytosanitary uh, website. Uh, is a uh, I can't remember what it's called now, <laughs> but uh, I can share it later. Uh, yep, we can do that. Yep, yeah, uh, it's the EU website, and they publish monthly. And uh, that thank you, Pierre. You're a fight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they publish monthly and annual summary of the, of all the uh, invasive inter, uh, pests being intercepted. And you can type in and you can search for four army worms and you will see that in, for example, in Guyana or somewhere like that, where they export um, capsicum. So four army worms farming capsicum, for example. Hmm. Um, in other places where they import uh, Asparagus from South America, they're found on South America. Um, they were, you know, they were actually, they, they didn't do well in, in Coso. Again, okay. they, they, were, they were actually found on maize in, in Germany, but they die out <laughs> because of the extreme cold. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, so, so. So trade could be a factor and I guess understanding is, that more. I, yeah, I think trade is definitely a factor because if you, there's just not, you, the pests just can fly so far from South America into, for example, Malaysia or, or China. It's just too far. And, and the genetic diversity is just too diverse for it to be just, uh, if you like, you know, by natural introduction. Okay, excellent. Now, here's the big question, and everyone always asks this. I'm just going to ask it again. But, I mean, you you drew attention to the the picture in, was it 2009 in Vietnam of a full army? 2008. Yeah. 2008, sorry, even a year before. <laughs> in a thesis and it definitely does look like a full army worm for, for sure but um why then all of a sudden a big population boom in 2018 2019 what, what what's happening in between if it was introduced earlier what could be the factors i mean it's a crystal ball i know and you don't know yeah it, look uh in fact the ppri people so the plant protection research institute uh where our partners came from uh dr Nguyen and dr hang uh Hang Di Dao, um, they shared the, the literature with me and they've been, you know, in Vietnam, the, they publish in the local language. They've been saying it since 2008 that they have the past. And in fact, um, they, they, they say that, you know, like when the past was supposed to have just arrived in Vietnam, you can go to anywhere in Vietnam and you find a past. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not too sure how to say it. Maybe it's communication issue. Maybe it's the translation of the past name that, that is, you know, in the local language is not being brought to attention. It's just really quite difficult to, to understand why, but it's, I don't think it just all of a sudden appear there. They're, they've been saying that they have that past yeah. and, and it's everywhere. You can go out there and you find it everywhere. Yeah, 
Okay, excellent. Um, Tech, thank you so much. I'm going to end it there because we're, we're just sort of four minutes past. I'm going to give a quick, very brief summary, but fantastic presentation, fantastic research as well. Um, really interesting and I think um, really important um, what you mentioned in the research gaps, and I'm almost giving a bit of a summary now actually, but what you mentioned in those gaps is really important, understanding the pests that we're dealing with. Uh, really understanding the different populations and what that might mean for the solutions that we uh, use or develop and uh, implement in the field is, is really critical. Um, it's really important. So um, thank you for actually providing that sort of research gap summary. I think that's really important. Um, so once again, thank you from all of us. And I'd like to also thank our other two speakers, uh, Dr. Mara and Dr. Andy Trisiono. Um, Dr. Ma talked about how climate change can impact uh, on the emerging resistance um, from the expansion of overwintering zones uh, of pests. And I think that's a really uh, great demonstration of showing uh, quite starkly uh, how climate change can impact on um, the spread, the uh, movement of pests, and then what that might mean in, in the fact that we need new management strategies and we need good communication in those areas where that pest is new to, to ensure that we don't get uh, uh, an increase in resistance. Um, Andy, great presentation again. Um, you, you're, you're, you've presented before, but this really, this research really showed um, all those different resistance profiles across fall armyworm, um, particularly in Indonesia, um, but those different populations and how important, just like Tech pointed out, it is to understand that. Uh, so we can see what we're dealing with uh, and also then design appropriate management strategies to actually ensure that uh, this doesn't become an increasing problem um, and that we can um, adequately respond to it. So, so thank you very much for that. Um, just building off of what Tech had in his last slide, talked about those gaps. We had some really good gaps um, that were raised and some potential ideas in the last part one series of the of part one session of this series. Um, Tech has sort of really nicely put those together in that last slide. What we're going to do is we're going to put those together. We're going to have the two presentations. They will be online for you to download as the video or the PDF. Uh, and we'll put together a bit of a concept note uh, with some ideas of what could be the next steps and what could people work together on uh, in the future and what could those priorities be. So some really interesting work here. Incredibly important. Climate change is not going away. I, I was interesting text slide on, I think, on the hot events there and fire and all sorts of things. Things. You see the last couple of months, but I think all your pictures in that first slide were in the last four weeks or three weeks, and it looked <laughs> like an inferno. So um, definitely uh, a huge concern, and particularly with the, the recent flooding in Pakistan. So um, for anyone who's from Pakistan here today, um, condolences to you, because I know that's been a huge, huge impact in your country. So we're all, we're all looking out for everyone here. Uh, and thank you also for everyone who attended today. So not only the speakers, but all the participants. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got a lot out of it and feel free to contact us we want the discussion to carry on and we hope this gave a bit of a talking point and i'm just going to hand over to tech briefly just one Go question tech. actually yep. for you allison is uh because we didn't have q a can we save this chat at we all? certainly can yep Thank definitely you. so don't worry <laughs> and i'm sorry about the q a but actually it's quite nice seeing everyone chat and ask their questions sometimes you don't always see them um so the chats chat worked well but sorry about that but listen have a uh, safe uh, week everyone thank you for joining us and uh goodbye from us and all the speakers thank you